Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I've, uh, it's good to see you all. I, I, in a way, I feel I should be apologising for such a harrowing experience yesterday. It was a difficult morning. Uh, today, um, we're dealing with a couple of meaty men. Uh, it's not quite as harrowing, but it's, it's not all flowers and, uh, and sunlight, so I, you are forewarned. A lady did say that my microphone is a little bit capricious. It's not the microphone, it's when I turn my head to look at the screen. I'm not quite centred up, so don't be shy about shooting your hand up. Uh, just to remind me to, be, to speak up and be sure everybody benefits. Could I also remind you about cell phones, please, um, just to check, if you would, that they are turned off. Thank you. So today we're going to be uh, looking at two artists, Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon, who are regarded as probably the most important portraitists of the 20th century. But to understand their work, you really need to see it in context. And so I think we should just spend a few minutes together uh, looking back at uh, portraiture right from the beginning, just looking back over the centuries, just a quick tour, so you can see how portraiture evolved in Western Europe from the ancient Greeks right up to the present time, and then see the leap that Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon gave uh, this discipline. So let's start back then uh, in ancient Greece. Uh, where most uh, portraits, in fact almost all portraits, took the form of either statues or busts. And their purpose was not to portray the physical features of the individual, but the essence of what they represented, up to which the populace would look and uh, admire and be role models for them. And here is a lovely example of Socrates. I don't think anybody knows for sure what Socrates actually looked like, but from this bust, you can see with his half-closed eyes and his enormous forehead that he simply emanates wisdom. And that was what portraiture was all about in the ancient world. A true likeness was an unusual um, event in, in uh, portraiture, but here from Roman uh, Egypt, around the time of the birth of Christ, we do have a likeness from a funeral setting. This is a funerary portrait where a likeness was demanded by the family. The inscription tells us that her name was Idadora, but beyond that we know nothing about her. But we can infer from her gold jewellery that she was clearly a person of some substance. And then there's a gap of over a thousand years, taking us right up to the 14th century, when here we have Jan van Eyck's Dresden triptych, with the Madonna and Child in the centre, a magnificent uh, work from 1300. It's only now that we begin to see the common man appearing in a portrait, and he makes a cameo appearance. Can you see there on the left-hand panel in green, kneeling, is the donor of this portrait, a Genoese merchant, Justiniani. We know his name from the insignia that's uh, behind there. <coughs> and so the common man begins to appear, but in this very uh, reserved and modest way. Weddings now became an, a reason for portraits, and again Van Eyck here with the celebrated Arnulfini portrait. <coughs> on the left, Giovanni, and on the right, his bride, Giovanna. And such paintings are usually rich with symbolism. We can see, for example, that Giovanna is standing there in his stocking feet, having taken his shoes off, pushed off to the side there. Why? Because he's in the presence of God, a sacred ceremony. And above his hat in the chandelier there, you can see the presence of God indicated by one burning candle. A marriage portrait, it's appropriate to have a dog in the scene, a, symptom, a symbol of fidelity. And we can't see it in this magnification, but close, close up on that chair at the back there, on the finial, is a carving of the patient saint of childbirth. So full of symbolism. As you go up the pecking order in society and you have the nobility having their portraits taken, things have to look a little bit grander. And here we have Battista Sforza from the famous Sforza family that ruled Milan. And here she is with her new husband, painted by Piero della Francesca. Looking grand, so grand in fact, that he's painted them in, in profile as if they were an empress and an emperor on a Roman coin. He's also indicated the union of their two houses by the continuity of the background. Can you see the fields and the hills and the river in the background? 
unifying the two forces. And of course, a grand frame is appropriate, so grand, in fact, it's almost like an altarpiece. But when you get to the monarchy, of course, you get the grandest portraits of all. And almost always, these were full-length portraits of the monarch in regalia. But Henry VIII had a problem. He had broken away from the Roman church. Uh, he had married and divorced and married and divorced. And he had to assert his authority because he was still being questioned by his people. And so here he asks his court portraitist, Hans Holbein, whom he had recruited from the German estates, to paint him close up. He did portraits full length, of course, but here he wanted to demonstrate just from his facial appearances alone that here was somebody not to be messed with and he had the authority to break from Rome, a divorce, and do what he will. He had a problem now because he divorced two wives and now he was uh, in need of a third without any heir. His courtiers suggested that Anne of Cleves would make a suitable bride for him. And today, of course, you'll just get somebody in Anne's court to zap off a photo on your iPhone and zap it round the world in one millisecond, and there you are. But Henry didn't have that advantage. So he sends Holbein off to the German states again to visit Anne of Cleves. And of course, a court portraitist, his job is to flatter. And of course, he paints this rather flattering uh, view of Anne of Cleves, smoothing out her uh, awkward facial features. And he presents this to Henry on his return, and he gives it the nod, and the wedding is arranged, sight unseen, based on Holbein's picture. <laughs> and you know the rest, of course. <laughs> he took one look at her, and uh, it is said the wedding was never consummated. But the reason that Henry was so concerned about his image being portrayed was of this man, Sir Thomas Moore, his chancellor, who vehemently opposed the break with Rome and chastised Henry as far as he could, his monarch, over his divorces. And here Holbein demonstrates his ability as a psychological portraitist. You can see the intensity of his gaze, and if Henry is not to be messed with, nor is Sir Thomas Moore. Henry recognized this, and as you know, had him executed. The problem now was for his successor, his, his daughter Elizabeth, Elizabeth I of England, who by all accounts was a plain lady so facial expression was not an issue in any way. Her court portraitist, um, uh, Hilliard, Richard Hilliard, uh, was not of the same league as Holbein in terms of character in the face. So he gives her a rather bland, mask-like face. He was, by training, a jeweler. So it came natural to him to embellish and convey the majesty of the queen in her costume. And here it is. What an extraordinary... I, I don't know if there are any histo uh, uh, costume historians in the audience, but are those really those epaulettes? Do they really exist? I never recalled seeing those before, but presumably in some form they did. So here's Her Majesty conveyed simply by the sumptuousness of her costume rather than her character. But Hilliard was, also, was, to his credit, a great miniaturist, and we now begin to see miniatures appearing in portraiture for the first time. And here Elizabeth asks him to paint a portrait of her favourite, uh, Walter Riley, Sir Walter Riley, and it is said that she never let this miniature out of her sight. Britain was now entering the Golden Age. Unlike when she first succeeded to the throne with that uh, opulent jewel dress, now Britain was much more magnificent. In the background here, you can see the defeat of the Spanish Armada, and on the right-hand side at the back there, that darker panel in green and blue, is where the remnants of the Spanish fleet went around Britain to escape back to Spain and were trapped in a storm and the ships were battered ashore. So that is depicted here. So here again we have the same problem with Elizabeth's features. We're not interested, she, well, we're not able to render her psychologically, but what we now do is have this absolutely bloated, amazing costume, the rough there with all its jeweled figures, um, to represent her increased majesty as England reached its golden age with the defeat of Spain and the rise of Shakespeare. And again, it's replete with symbols to reinforce the message. At the bottom right-hand corner there, you can see a gilded mermaid implying Britain's dominance over the seas. The crown, of course, on the table. And her right hand there, you can see at the bottom left of the screen, resting on a globe of the earth, her fingers spread out on the eastern seaboard of North America in the process of being colonized. So symbolism, 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 not the character of the individual is the hallmark here. 
But this is an entirely different story. A century later, Diego Valesquez out Holbein, Holbein in terms of character. I don't know, many of you I'm sure have been to Rome, and if you have, I do hope that you visited the Galleria Doria Pamphili. And if you, have, if you didn't, please go back and do so, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because of this portrait, which I think is probably the most compelling portrait I've ever seen, and I think that view is shared by many, many. It's a portrait of Pope Innocent X, and it doesn't do justice in reproduction, as I'm sure you would understand, but it is housed on the first floor, so you go up, you know, the problem with Italian galleries, they have these masterpieces, but the, uh, there just isn't the funding to maintain the museums in the way that uh, you and I would like. But for him, it's different. He's up on the gallery, but not in a room, he's along the corridor on the first floor, you go up the stairs, turn right, and he's on the corridor, completely enclosed in a velvet curtained booth. There's just room for one person in that booth. And you hold the curtain aside and you go inside and there you are, three feet away from this man staring down at you, spotlit, his eyes penetrating you, every bit the Machiavellian lawyer he was before he acceded to the papacy. It sends shivers down your spine and I promise you the journey to Rome would be worth it. <laughs> and then there was painting in the Netherlands because the Velasquez was the court painter to Philip IV of Spain and now we have Holland arising in its golden age in the 1600s and of course Rembrandt was their star painter. At that time inexpensive good quality mirrors were now available for the first time which allowed painters to paint their own portraits. Self-portraiture was very hit and miss and almost non-existent prior to that time. What purpose does a self-portrait serve? Well, it's a calling card for an artist. So he paints himself and then he goes around hawking his picture to show prospective clients what he's capable of doing. And if the style is approved, then of course that's how he makes his living. But for Rembrandt, it was much more than just that. It was a way of experimenting. And here you can see his experimenting with the effects of light and shade. Also, it was a means of testing out costumes that he wanted to use in his large biblical tableaus that he produced. And here he is, much older, in such a costume. And then, of course, as we all know, later on, uh, as he aged, he came to grips with the aging process with numerous portraits of himself depicting the physical features changing uh, with that process with which he had to finally reconcile himself. Holland in the Golden Age, it was really the Dutch, Dutch state at the time, the Dutch Republic, civic organizations were organizing as mercantilism took hold and a merchant class rose up. And these civic organizations were now able to commission group portraits. And where you stood in a group portrait depended, of course, on how much you paid towards the cost of the painting. And here we see Captain Franz Bendik Koch standing there with the sash, about to leave, lead his militia off on a night patrol for which they had commissioned Rembrandt. Merchants now were, had enough money, and more than that, they had enough social status to command portraits in their own right. And here we have Adolf Kreuser, a merchant in Amsterdam, sitting on what looks like a throne on a dais. And at his knee there is his daughter, dressed in finery, looking for all the world like a courtier. And just to make the point, young Steen, who made this portrait of Kreuser, puts in a beggar woman uh, coming by seeking arms as a contrast between the wealth of the merchant and the everyday folk. And then what did merchants fill, fill their houses with? They needed to put pictures up on the walls, not just of themselves, but of people or scenes that they would identify with. And here, young Steen obliges the merchant by painting a troupe of traveling players, all of whom as individuals would probably be known to the purchaser. But now we're back, we're as far forward now as the 18th century, 17th century England, where the aristocracy still called the shots. And here we have Lord Haddo painted, languishing in a sort of a, a comfortable pose, fashionable at the time, leaning on a, on a parapet there, beautifully carved, 
looking up at a bust of a statue of, in classical costume, indicative of his social standing, his classical education, his breeding, and his hunting dog at his foot there, telling you that he had large estates. So symbolism, symbolism carries through from the monarchy to the aristocracy. The ladies in England in the 18th century were very keen to have themselves portrayed as Greek goddesses. And here we have Jane, Countess Harrington, painted by none other than England's leading portraitist at the time, Sir Joshua Reynolds, portrayed as the goddess of joy, one of the three Greek graces who were acolytes to Aphrodite. Things changed in the 19th century. And here, Franz uh, Xavier Winterhalter's famous portrait of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. So now there is an informality, and families are beginning to appear, and children are beginning to appear in portraiture as well. And this portrait was commissioned to commemorate the birth of their fifth child, as you can see the little baby there uh, being coddled by their two younger daughters. That picture there was, of course, uh, an, a, a, an example for the people of Britain of family values and uh, moral, the moral principles of the Victorian era. It was a role model picture, essentially. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was the invention of photography. And everybody predicted, well, that's the end of the portrait painter. We didn't need him anymore. But not so. Because what photography did, it freed the portrait painter up to experiment in other ways, psychologically and also in terms of composition. And here we have Ed, uh, uh, Degas, Edvard Degas, Edgar Degas' portrait of the Belili family. They were actually cousins of his. And here he paints the mother gazing rather coldly into the distance there, protectively standing over her two children, while her husband there is almost out of the frame with his back to us, his shoulder turned towards them with a gulf between them. And it, you don't have to be a psychiatrist to realize that husband and wife here were scarcely on speaking terms. <laughs> and then psychological influences come into portraiture at the beginning of the 20th century. Here, Oscar Kokoschka portrays himself lying there in a sort of dream with swirls of turmoil. He's dreaming of lying with Alma, the wife of Gustav Mahler, with whom he had fallen in love, but whose affection was not returned. And you can see the tension in his toes there on the right, and the swirling bedclothes and scenery all around, indicating the inner turmoil that he was feeling when he painted this. And then we have Oskar Kokoschka. Uh, we have uh, Egon Schiele, the young Egon Schiele, who now turns a self-portrait into a catharsis getting out his demons, his contorted face, his contorted body, his contorted limbs there, um, trying to express what's inside. So here portraiture turns psychological. So this is the setting for Lucian Freud. And here's Lucian Freud in the 20th century now, the grandson, of course, the great Sigmund Freud. And what he was concerned with was not so much likeness, but what lay under the skin in terms of the thought processes, the personalities, the anxieties, the fears of his subject. Not as overt and in your face as Kokoschka or Sheila, much more subtle. But I think you'll see as we go through some of his work that he actually uh, achieved what he was setting out to do. <coughs> By the age of 79, he was, such a, he was recognized as England's leading portrait painter. He said here, I look at the human condition, and here am I, part of it. And he will, as we're going to come to discover, he regarded himself and basically all humanity as just part of the spectrum of animals of the world, except we were just happened to be of the human variety. And this was his basically underlying thought process about who he was painting. But at 79, he was England's leading painter and was commissioned to paint none other than Her Majesty the Queen. For the occasion, he deigned to put on a suit, which was always pleasing, and he didn't require Her Majesty to remove any of her clothes either. <laughs> but having said that, uh, she doesn't altogether look a very happy camper, does she? <laughs> she granted him six, setting, six sittings, and what she thought of the final result <laughs> is a closely guarded state secret. <laughs> 
There she is, tight-lipped, a bit of a squint, an over-heavy crown precariously balanced on her head, so perhaps the less said the better. He was much, much, much more comfortable painting people he knew, his friends. And here he is with uh, Brigadier Andrew uh, Parker Bowles, who was a riding companion of his, as well as a friend. And his manner of interacting with his portrait subjects was very much an inheritance from his grandfather, Sigmund Freud. And by that I mean he was an excellent listener and a very astute observer. And the manner of the interaction would be, it would take place for the sittings over weeks, months, and on occasions, even years. It would be an open-ended arrangement. He would never say when the painting would be finished. He would just say, let's just see how it goes. And it could go on and on and on. And during the sittings, which lasted two, three, four hours sometimes, he would engage his subject in intelligent two-way conversation not just small talk chatter, as in the hairdresser. He would be probing, learning about their personality, their fears, their anxieties, past experiences, all of which goes into his computer head and hopefully will come out in his brush. Not only that, he would invite them for dinner. And then over dinner, he would observe them like a hawk as they ate. Military portraits, and this is what Parker Bowles was having done. He was a brigadier in the household cavalry, having his military portrait done. Military portraits are almost always memorable for the exotic uniform, but almost never for the individual himself. And here is the portrait he actually did of Parker Bowles over this many, many times. Rather than the debonair brigadier, household cavalry, we have a man in his uniform true, but look, his tunic is unbuttoned, and we can see his paunch. Can you see his fleshy face there? His eyes looking introspectively, his downturned mouth clearly fearful of something. Quite different from that photograph where he's all debonair and relaxed and just having a drink with uh, Lucien. This is the portrait that came out from these many, many sittings. His hand spread rather nervously, his other hand, fingers tightly grasped. So who was this character, Lucian Freud? His history is absolutely fascinating. This is a picture taken of him in 1938 in the garden of Sigmund Freud's house in Merfield Gardens in Hampstead in London. You may have visited the Freud Museum, which it now is. Lucian there at 16, he was born in Berlin and came across as a refugee from Nazi Germany. His father, Sigmund, joining him from Vienna in only in 1938 after the Anschluss. And because of uh, Sigmund's uh, reputation internationally, they were very well connected, even though they had arrived in Britain as refugees. And he had an entree into society. And among the many people that young Lucian met at that day, coming through the family house, was the poet Stephen Spender, who met the young Lucian and was quite impressed. And he said of him later, this young man is the most intelligent person I've ever met since Oxford. He looks like Harpo Marx. <laughs> and is amazingly talented and also wise. So the genes are going through the family, I think. He had no difficulty getting uh, uh, accepted at the Central School of Art in London and after spending a stint there and then again in another art school in East Anglia, he uh, did a stint in the Merchant Navy because 38 was when he came, his grandfather came, and of course the First Second World War and in, he was drafted he chose to serve in the Merchant Marine on Atlantic convoys. But after several years, he was uh, invalided out uh, and then resumed his painting, having had really very little, if any, formal training. A few months at the Central School in London and a few months here and there in East Anglia, and that was it. So now he's back uh, after the war, um, after his war service, and he does this self-portrait. Spooky, I'm not sure how one would describe it. His ears sticking out, his tight lips, cheeks a bit drawn there, these enormous hands, one clutching a feather. Interestingly, the scene is at night. What a curious time of day to do a self-portrait. Over his shoulders, in the, in the window there, is a crow. And precariously balanced in the window at the top there on the left looks like a child, perhaps about to fall. So clearly, some psychological element, we don't know, it's enigmatic, 
But this is how he portrayed himself just at 18 years of age. And then he met a lot of people from uh, uh, the high society in which uh, uh, Sigmund uh, moved in London. He met uh, Jacob Epstein, the sculptor, whose daughter here, Kitty, um, was introduced to young Lucian because he was an eligible bachelor coming from such a distinguished family. And before they knew it, the two of them married. And there he paints her, looking strange, uh, this sort of uh, like a, an alabaster uh, statue, big eyes, a little bit scared, mouth slightly open there, clutching two roses, her hair, though, meticulously and lovingly done, each strand almost like a Leonardo. But two years later, they were divorced. And now young Lucien um, is a bachelor again, uh, and he decides uh, to go off to Paris and to change the scenery. And in Paris, he has an entree to Paris high society. And among the people in the circle he's introduced to is, the, is Prince George of Denmark and his wife, and also the granddaughter of the Marquis de Sade, who holds salons in Paris where to Paris comes, and Lucien is a frequent guest at their dinner table. So these are the circles of glitz, gilded life that he was leading there. But after a while, this palled on him and he went back to London and took up a studio in Paddington. Paddington, as you probably know, in West London, it's now all gentrified because London's changed since I was a boy. But in the 1940s, early 50s, it was really a very poor rundown district, still displaying a lot of bomb damage. Lucien bought a studio there and spent his time, very much time, in Soho in illicit gambling dens. Gambling was illegal at that time. And he would spend his time with the down and outs, and he said later he felt much more comfortable with the down and outs of London than with the high society of Paris. And there in the gambling den in Soho, he met this uh, uh, character here, Harry Diamond, who was a photographer. And he invites Harry, he says, I'd like to do your portrait. And Harry agrees, I'm not sure he's happy with the result, but there's his portrait. <laughs> A small man, as you can see, trousers too big for him, hanging down, an overcoat that's too big, all creased there. Um, but there's his portrait. And the word got around now that Lucian Freud did portraits. So that was interesting. And with his high-flowing, flying circle of friends of the family in London, significant people with influence came to have their portrait painted, including... Lord Rothermere's wife. Lord Rothermere was the owner, was it the Daily Express? I'm not quite sure if it was the Daily Express or the Daily Mail, but one of the press barons in London, um, his wife came to have her portrait, Lady Rothermere. And she was friendly with the uh, Marquis, whose daughter was here, is Caroline Blackwood. Caroline Blackwood, the daughter of a Marquis, was introduced to the eligible young, handsome young man, I think you would agree, eligible young uh, grandson of the famous Sigmund Freud. So the attraction was there immediately, if only through uh, family connections. But the two of them hit it off, and I'm not sure what the Marquis thought when Caroline went back to say that she and Lucien would like to get married. The upshot of it all was, we don't know what, what transpired in the family, but the upshot of it was they eloped off to Paris together. And there they were eventually married. And here Lucien does a portrait of her. Can you see? Looking rather doe-eyed, rather wistful, in bed. But again, things went sour very quickly in the marriage. And then within the year, there they were. There she is in bed, eyes, lids heavy, looking blankly ahead. And there's Lucien looking down at the window there at her. A great gulf in the same way that Edgar Degas with the Belili family showed the gulf between husband and wife. Here we have Lucien Freud recognising what was happening to his own marriage. So he goes back to London again. The two of them divorcing. Takes a bigger studio in Paddington and now to reinforce the fact that he is much more involved in the down and outs of his area than the, the aristocracy of London and Paris. He paints with meticulous detail, almost like a canaletto, the scene out of his studio window. The backs of tenement houses, and in particular, the loving care he's devoted to portray that rubbish dump immediately outside there in front of the fence. 
So this was where his mind was coming from, and he would spend time and engage in conversation, tramps in the street and people in bombed out buildings. Immediately below the apartment where he had his studio and where he was living was a scar-faced bank robber who approached Lucien and said, I'd like hear you do portraits. Would you like to do a portrait, please, of my daughter? And I can pay you with some of my loot. <laughs> And I'm not sure being an accessory to robbery was quite what Lucien was expecting, but that was his reputation. But now he's beginning to focus more seriously about what painting means to him. And he's really probing what is the nature of the human condition. Because, you know, you might as well be a photographer if you're just going to paint a likeness and say, here's your portrait. So he's interested in something much more profound than that. And he paints this curious self-portrait. He's so small, he's almost invisible until you search around and find him up towards the left at the top there. There he is, unclothed, naked, behind this great uh, tropical plant, with his hand to his ear, as if to say, I'm asking the question, what does it mean to be human? And he's putting his hand to his ear as if waiting for a reply. And at that particular moment in time, he suddenly stands back and thinks that his whole way of painting is not really getting him anywhere, not fulfilling him. And so what he does, he knows that de Kooning is the big man in America, and he looks at de Kooning and sees that de Kooning does, he does de Kooning painted standing up, in that way he could do his big brush strokes without any impediment. So Freud thinks, well, let me just try something completely different. He starts standing up to paint for the first time instead of sitting down and, and abandons his fine meticulous brushes with which he did those lock, lovely locks of hair of Kitty, you remember, puts those aside, picks up big stiff brushes and now starts painting his people here with such vigour you can see the face is almost now like a contour map, a patch of red telling a story, a patch of green telling another story of the history of this girl who uh, uh, became uh, his mistress. She was a student of his, Susie Bryant, a student who became a mistress and amazingly went on to be the mother of four of his children. Four, I should say, of his many children. So here he's developed this style in which he's trying to probe, it's as if he's peeling away layers of the skin to get to the real person. This is what he's thinking at this moment. But then he's got another concern as well, this concern that man is really a human animal with capital A animal, just human small h. And here he does a series of nudes, not voluptuous nudes, like Renoir, what could be more different to Renoir uh, than this, where the body is simply a collection of bones and skin and flesh, as you can see. The head, which makes, of course, the character of the individual, is turned away, not even in the picture, as it were. So here is his take of the female torso, and it makes us come, it comes, brings to mind, of course, Rembrandt's famous ox carcass. Not that he makes an exact parallel, but I think just from the way you see he splayed the limbs, and the way that the ribs are so prominent there, it couldn't have been far from his mind. But now we come to what I think are real gems of his work. And here we have the painter Frank Auerbach, a distinguished painter, painting very much in de Kooning's big style. And he's a good friend of Lucien Freud. And Frank Auerbach sits for his portrait, and this is the finished work. And in this work, we see, curiously, you don't see much of, you see, you see his face, but in this curious downturn manner, as if it isn't the face that matters, it's the mental processes going on in his head. And full front and center there is his big forehead, hair receding. And through the forehead, the way he's painted this, you can almost see Frank Auerbach's brain pulsating. And perhaps the greatest of his portraits at all is of his mother. His relationship with his mother was fraught. I suppose like all Jewish mothers, your son is no good, you've got to do what I say, sit down, finish your soup, do your, put your pullover on, you're not going out, it's cold. And so he distanced himself from that. But when his father died, his mother went into a deep depression. She became apathetic, she didn't take care of herself, she wore the same clothes day in, day out. And to try to give her some purpose to her life, Lucian says, 
Mother, please, why don't you sit for me and I'll do your portrait? So she says, all right, all right, and she sits. And he does this portrait over many, many sittings. And the more you look at it, the more I personally become engaged, and I'm sure you do too. There she is, her hair, a bit disheveled for the portrait. She says, well, I'd better comb my hair. So she cursively, cursively puts her hair, brush through her hair. The rest of it's not done. She's wearing the same outfit that she wore all the time. She's tight-lipped because she has nothing to say. And she stares blankly across the room, lost in her own thoughts. And I don't need to say any more. I, I, think, I think you can see where he's coming from. Ten years later, he paints her again. <laughs> and his poor mother now, it's, she's wearing a sort of sepulchral white robe, <laughs> as if lying on the bed waiting to die. And there she is, gazing up to the ceiling, the same woman, but now more gaunt. The blinds are drawn. Uh, stubbornly, she goes on living for another four years, much to her great frustration. And now we have another portrait, a telling portrait as well. And this is of the Baron Hans Heinrich Thiessen born Amitza. Bit of a mouthful. You know the name Thiessen from the lifts. Elevators are sometimes made by the Thiessen company. And he was the, one of the patriarchs of the Thiessen uh, company, which heavy industry, coal mining, steel production, armaments, uh, engineering. And he was really now the head of that uh, family. And they were, of course, with their immense wealth, great art collectors. And those of you who have been to Madrid, I would not be surprised if you've already been to the Borna Mitsa Museum, the Tisa Borna Mitsa Museum, just down the hill a little bit from the Prado, which houses the core of the family's art collection. And here is the Baron himself, who goes to Lucien for his portrait. So let's just pause for a moment as we look at him there, sitting there over many sittings. Lucien's been talking to him, getting to know about his family and one thing or another. And he's sitting there, looking down introspectively at the floor, thinking back to his past, he's 60 years old now, thinking back to his life of his five failed marriages. His hands splayed on his thighs, signifying to him perhaps the roots of his family tree. Quite telling, I think. And then, of course, there is <laughs> my favourite of all, Sue Tilly. Uh, um, no, f Lucien had never seen anything quite like it before. <laughs> And Sue, bless her, was uh, a supervisor in the British um, Social Services Department uh, in the Benefits Office. And to earn some extra money, she posed for artists, and Lucien just couldn't believe his luck when she agreed to pose for him. <laughs> and here she is on the couch, and here, many months later, is his portrait of her. She's dozed off there, supporting her mounds of flesh. You can almost feel the heat radiating from her body. Yet, she retains her dignity. I think you agree. It's a curious mixture, isn't it? Nothing erotic in the least about that. But as he was now approaching his 80s, he realized that he was nothing more than just sagging flesh, bones, and wasting muscle, and paints himself accordingly. The human animal. And to make the point, he asks his studio assistant to pose for him on the bed with his whippet dog. So, man, animal, what's the difference? Siamese twins, almost. This is what's in his mindset now as he's getting old and crusty and his really all the niceties of human behavior are really fading into the distance and he's getting down to basics. But for the first time, we see a glint of humor in this man because he calls this painting Eight Legs. Well, let's just count them. We've got, two. <laughs> We've got two on the artist's assistant there. We've got four on the dog, but, but we're missing two. <laughs> so he obliges by painting two knees poking out from underneath the bedclothes. <laughs> he also does some self-portraits, which are quite telling. Here he is at the age of 40, full into that contoured way of peeling away the layers getting in there, every contour, what a rich life he's had. I mean, all the, he had no fewer than 14 children at the latest count, known children from numerous different women. So what was going on in his head? I mean, what a complex man he was. His social circle, his bank robber Scarface, his down and outs, um, his gambling. At the age of 40, 
every episode in his life is etched in his face there in those contours, I'm sure you would agree. And now at 60, he's getting gaunt, cheeks sunk in, eyes receding, nose becoming beaked. But at 80, now he's reconciling himself to the end of his life, the veins on his hand, clutching at a scarf around his neck, and his jacket covers an otherwise naked body. And he's placed himself in front of a board, and that board is the board on which he used to uh, rub his brushes to get off excess paint, accumulated over months and years. And he placed that board behind because it was that paint and those brushes that gave meaning to his life. Let me leave the last word on Lucian Freud before we come on to uh, Bacon, to John Richardson. John Richardson is a highly respected British art historian who's just completed the fourth volume of a four-volume biography of Picasso, which is highly regarded as the definitive work on the painter. And he sat for Lucian Freud, and there's the, po the portrait of John Richardson. And he said later, as he was describing the process of sitting for Lucian, he said, as my portrait proceeded, I was fascinated to watch as an inner as well as an outer likeness slowly emerged. Then on the ninth day of sitting, I confronted the real me, apprehensive, not to say fearful, which I usually try to conceal under a mask of confidence and geniality. Isn't that beautiful? So we'll take a breath. Let me just take a little sip. So if we're not... Uh, we're deep already, <laughs> but now we're going deeper still. <coughs> well, I did say it wouldn't be all roses today. <laughs> um, Francis Bacon, then. If, uh, if Lucian Freud wanted just to peel away the surface with Francis Bacon, we dig right down to the core of the individual. Likeness doesn't come into it. And here, a portrait of his friend, uh, the artist, uh, Isabel Rochthorn. And he paints her, a little bit of a likeness maybe, but to Francis Bacon, she was all eyes. All she was was eyes as an artist, peeling around, looking for subjects, delving into what she wanted to paint. The rest of her was cloaked in black, like an overcoat. And that's what he portrays here. And then he portrays, he does this self-portrait a little bit of something, perhaps it is his ear, but we, we would have no clue that he actually looked like that. It's not meant to be a self-portrait of what Francis Bacon looked like, it's how he saw the world. And you can see it's got a big black streak there because uh, rather like, uh, uh, we'll come to that in a moment, um, a black patch over one eye, his negative view of humankind. We would bandy around the word greatest painters, and I think we take all that with a pinch of salt, but let's go on after the comma, Francis Bacon, who conveys the tragedy of human existence. For Lucian Freud, the human was a human animal, which I think you could see with all the anxieties in the head. But for Francis Bacon, it was the very tragedy of human existence that motivated his painting. A layer deeper. So who was this character? Well, he was born in 1909 in Dublin. He came from a family of, uh, his mother was a, from a family of Sheffield cutlers, quite well to do. His father was a clerk in the British Army who had very strong views about manliness. And young Francis found himself, while still at school, more attracted to boys uh, than to girls, and this was to be a problem for the family relationship before very long. 1914, the family outbreak of the First World War, the family moved to Britain, to London. And then 1918, they go back to Dublin again, which still bore the scars of the 1916 uprising when Irish nationalists try to uh, claim independence from the British crown. Two years later, still the scars were apparent. In that uprising, which was put down by the British army ruthlessly, as you know, partly a result of disorganization by the Irish who wanted to have a national, like, national uprising and there was poor coordination, the whole thing collapsed. The upshot of it was that hundreds died on both sides and many thousands were wounded. The ringleaders were tried and one by one were executed by firing squad in the courtyard of this grim prison. 
This was the Dublin to which Bacon returned. During the 1920s, Dublin was very much a, a low-grade war zone with barricades across the street, no-go areas. And at this point, the 18-year-old Bacon had a blistering row with his father, who accused him of being a pansy and you're not a son of mine, and he threw him out of the house. What did he do? He goes off to Paris. And in Paris, he spends quite a lot of time in the cinema. He didn't know very many people or anybody at all. And what do you do in a strange town? You go into a cinema. He saw lots of films, but the one that stayed with him and moved him more than any was Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin. You remember this predated the 1917 uh, revolution, but there were lots of mini-revolutions well before 1917. And in the film, he graphic, Eisenstein graphically depicts the savagery meted out by the officers.